Ladies and gentlemen, it's Aaron Bulma here, serving as military specialist for Carleton County. I'm going to give you another uh, talk tonight, another presentation. This one is on the Battle of the Atlantic. This will be part one of the Battle of the Atlantic, which would be um, 1939, 1940. So 1939, 1940, it's going to go through the, the happy times. It's going to go through uh, the first ship sunk, the convoy system, what happened during this time, uh, the U-boat tactics and the leaders, as I always do with my presentations. Um, so uh, I brought in some video here. Um, so this is the next presentation on my World War II timeline. Okay, thousands died in the Battle of the Atlantic. For the German side, it was the most risky and the, and the death toll was the highest among any trade that they that uh, in the Wehrmacht in the German military machine, um, forty over forty thousand uh, German submariners died during the Second World War. It was the most dangerous of any combat trade you could uh, go to in the Wehrmacht in the German military, and the Kriegsmarine put their top emphasis with Admiral Karl Deonitz, Admiral Raider, on the uh, starving out Great Britain it was certainly something that was a tra had certainly tragic for a lot of merchant uh, mar mariners over 72,000 were killed um, many many um, died in freezing waters many drowned uh, ships torpedoed tankers burned to death um, it was it, certainly during the Second World War, it was the longest battle within the Second World War, certainly on in the European theater. So, Battle of the Atlantic. So, this is the first part. Um, here we have uh, just a painting of a U boat sinking um, uh, I think one warship, I believe. I'm not sure what ship. But um, the Battle of the Atlantic. Was a struggle between the Allied and German forces for central for control of the Atlantic Ocean. The Allies needed to keep the vital flow of men and supplies going between North America and Europe, where they could be used in the fighting. While the Germans wanted to cut these supply lines, to do this, German submarines, U-boats, and other warships prowled the Atlantic Ocean, sinking Allied transport ships. The Battle of the Atlantic brought the war to Canada's doorstep with U-boats torpedoing ships within sight of Canada's east coast and even in the St. Lawrence River. Canada's Merchant Navy, along with the Royal Canadian Navy in the, and the Royal Canadian Air Force, played a key role in these efforts. East Coast cities soon found themselves involved in the battle since Allied convoys, groups of ships that crossed the Atlantic together under the protection of naval escorts were frequently leaving Busy ports like Halifax and Sydney, Nova Scotia, and St. John's, Newfoundland during the war. <coughs> uh, here's a Cinnamon tanker, I believe, that was torpedoed and going down. They certainly, the Germans certainly wanted to uh, target tankers to cut off the uh, British supply line of oil to Great Britain for the British war machine. The British had the largest merchant navy in the world, being an island nation. And they also had uh, one of the strongest navies in the world. Uh, the Germans, of course, only had, you know, 36 to 40 U-boats. Uh, I can't remember the exact number at the start of the war. And only, only well, just a few U-boats and only 34 or and above uh, surface ships. Um, they certainly did not have, the, the navy was the least ready out of the Luftwaffe and, and the German army, they the Navy was the least ready for war at the time. Early in the war, German U-boats took a heavy toll on merchant shipping as the Allies struggled to find effective way to combat the, the enemy threat. Between 1939 and 1942, the Germans increased the number of U-boats from 30 to 300. So there were 30 U-boats and then maybe 34 to 50 warships. I can't remember the exact numbers, but um they had a very small navy uh compared to but they were building onto it of course you have uh the battle cruiser skornhorst and then they have of course they're building the turpits and then the bismarck battleships 
and then in one aircraft carrier. Uh, so from 30 to 300, amazing, and developed uh, effective hunting techniques like using groups of submarines, wolf packs to attack convoys. Their efforts initially paid off with 454,000 tons of shipping being lost to German U-boats in June 1941 alone. Their successes continued as nearly 400 Allied ships were sunk between January and July 1942, where only seven U-boats were lost. The situation was very serious for the Allies, as merchant ships were being sunk faster than they could be replaced, thereby putting the supply link between North America and Europe at incredible great risk. So post-World War I, under the terms of the 1919 Treaty of Versailles, um, Germany was only allowed a minimal navy of 15,000 personnel, six capital ships of no more than 10,000 tons, six cruisers, 12 destroyers, 12 torpedo boats, and no submarines or aircraft carriers. The military aircraft were also banned, so Germany could have no naval aviation. Under the Treaty of Germany, Germany could only build new ships to replace old ones. All the, the ships allowed um, and personnel were taken over from the uh, Kaiserlich Marine, renamed the Reich Marine. From the outset, Germany worked to circumvent the military restrictions of the Treaty of Versailles. The Germans uh, continued to develop U-boats through a submarine defense office in the Netherlands, um, which is Ingers Ketzor Vor Schiefsbro, uh, and a submarine, or sorry, in a torpedo research program in Sweden where the G7E torpedo was developed. That would be the T2 torpedo. The T1 is the one they started using in the beginning of the war. Even before the Nazi seizure of power on the 30th of January 1933, the German government decided on 15th of November 1932 to launch a prohibited naval rearmament program that included U-boats, airplanes, and an aircraft carrier. The launching of the first pocket battleship Deutschland in 1931 as a replacement to the old pre-dreadnought battleship uh, Prussian was a step in the formation of a modern German fleet. The building of the Deutschland caused consternation among the French and British as they had expected that the restrictions of the Treaty of Versailles would limit the replacement of pre-dreadnought battleships to coastal defense ships, suitable only for defensive warfare. <clears throat> By using innovative construction techniques, the Germans had built a heavy ship suitable for offensive warfare on the high seas, while still abiding by the letter of the treaty. So the Kriegsmarine under Nazi control. When the Nazis came to power in 1933, Adolf Hitler soon began to more brazenly ignore many of the treaty restrictions and accelerated German naval rearmament. The Anglo-German Naval Agreement of 18th of June 1935 allowed Germany to build a navy equivalent of 35% of the British surface ship tonnage and 45% of British submarine tonnage. Battleships were to be limited to no more than 35,000 tons. That same year, the Reich Marine was renamed as the Kriegsmarine. <clears throat> In April 1939, as tension, tensions escalated between the United Kingdom and Germany over Poland, Hitler unilaterally uh, rescinded the restrictions of the Anglo-German Naval Agreement. The building up, the buildup of the German fleet in the time period of 1935-1939 was slowed by problems with marshalling enough manpower and material for shipbuilding. This was because of the simultaneous and rapid buildup of the German army and air force which demanded substantial effort and resources. Some projects like the D-class cruisers and the P-class cruisers had to be cancelled. So the Z-plan. Uh, there were different plans in the end. The, uh, the Third Reich, the uh, German military machine chose Hitler and his admirals and generals chose the Z-plan. The Z-Plan was Germany's fleet building program it started shortly before World War II. In the mid-1930s, a major discussion 
but a new fleet program is started in Germany. There were two major opinions. What kind of program should be have been chosen? One plan was focused on a large submarine fleet and a relatively small surface fleet for coast, coastal protection. This plan was preferred by U -boat, the U-boat fraction in the Kriegsmarine Command. The other alternative was a mixed fleet of various surface ships and a much smaller U-boat fleet, quite similar to the Imperial Navy in World War I or the British Royal Navy. In the end, this plan was chosen as the new fleet building program. After several modifications, it was called the Z-Plan. According to this plan, the German Kriegsmarine uh, should have grown to about 800 units, consisting of 13 battleships and battle cruisers, four aircraft carriers, 15 Panderschiffs, uh, Panderschiff, 23 cruisers, and 22 so called uh, Spankarzer, which were basically large destroyers. Um, in addition uh, to this, smaller, many smaller vessels should have been built. Those ships should have been built between 1939 and 1946. Um, oh, in this time, the personnel, the personal, the personnel of the Kriegsmarine should have been enlarged to 201,000 men, and over 33 billion Reichsmark should have been spent on building the new units. This project never got to reality. It was very questionable that the German industry would have had the resources for such a construction pro program and that the other European nations would, would stood still and not would stand still and not react to this program at all. The realization of the Z, Z plan started on January 29th, 1939. Uh, two H class battleships were laid down. These months, uh, late, these three months later, Germany quit the fleet treaty with England and the dream no more war against Britain was gone. But only four months later, Germany attacked Poland, and work on all Z plan project was stopped. During the next month, months, all incomplete ships of the Z plan were scrapped, and the material was used to build additional submarines. So this is the Kriegsmarine and what they were able to build. Um, <clears throat> so the Hipper, Prince Eugen, Deutschland. Skornhurst, Bismarck, Nuremberg, Leipzig, these are uh, battle cruisers and battleships. Um, and of course, the, uh, the Z class uh, destroyers and different types of, uh, of destroyers and escorts, as well as submarines. Um, the U boat fleet was to be the main, which would be, become the main. Um, success of the German Navy, um, particularly uh, in the Second World War, the biggest pain would be, the, of course, the Type 7 U-boats, Type 7A, Type 7B, and Type 7C, of which 568 were built. They sunk thousands of tons of shipping, of Allied shipping, uh, and that is how they could have won the Battle of the Atlantic if the Allies hadn't transformed their navies into submarine fighting capable, um, incapable of, sub of uh, mass submarine warfare. Um, <clears throat> the first depth charges that were, you know, were deployed were only able to go to depths of 91 meters. The, the depth charges, uh, 91 meters, the Type 7A could dive down to 150, 160 meters. Uh, type seven or type seven B go down to two hundred meters. Type seven C two hundred to two hundred and twenty meters would be crushed up. Roughly two hundred and twenty meters would be crushed up, and they could stay underwater for maybe six to twelve hours at a time without having to recharge their batteries. The Battle of the Atlantic pitted U-boats and other warships of the German Kriegsmarine Navy, and aircraft of the Luftwaffe against the Royal Navy, Royal Canadian Navy, and the United States Navy eventually. The Allied merchant shipping, convoys coming mainly from North America and predominantly going to the United Kingdom and the Soviet Union, were protected for the most part by the British and Canadian navies and air forces. 
These forces were aided by ships and aircraft of the United States beginning September 13th, 1941. Now, we're going to talk about before that, 1939, 1940, and the first ship sunk and whatnot. The Germans were joined by submarines of the Italian uh, Riga Marina, Regia Marina, Royal Navy, um, of the Italian Navy, after Germany's Axis ally Italy entered the war on June 10th, 1940. As a small island country, the United Kingdom was highly dependent on important and imported goods, as I mentioned. Britain required more than a, a million tons of imported material per week in order to survive and fight. In essence, the Battle of the Atlantic involved a tonnage war. The Allied struggle to supply Britain and Axis attempt to stem the flow of merchant shipping that enabled Britain to keep fighting. Here's some of the... Here is one, I think this is HX-72, uh, coming from Halifax. Halifax, Sydney, Nova Scotia, a lot of these ships, numbering anywhere from 4 to 7 to 10 to 12,000 tons. Uh, freighters, tankers, merchant ships of this size are prime targets for U-boats, um, and they can sink within minutes. So... The Royal Navy, still the largest in the world in September 1939, so it was directly the largest. Uh, U.S. Navy being another one, of course, the Japanese Navy being another one. The Royal Navy, so it had 15 battleships and battlecruisers, of which only two were post-World War I. Five King George V battlesh battleships were they were building. Seven aircraft carriers, 66 cruisers, mainly post-World War I with some older ships converted for AA, du AA duties. At the start of World War II in 1939, the Royal Navy was the largest in the world, with over 1,400 vessels. The Royal Navy provided critical cover during Operation Dynamo, the British evacuations of from Dunkirk, and as the ultimate deterrent to a German invasion of Britain was the Royal Navy. And during the first four months, certainly uh, the Battle of Britain, which I'd mentioned, the Royal Navy was certainly a great deterrent against operations, uh, Operation Sea Line, the, uh, the invasion of Great Britain, the plan which would never take place. At uh, Toronto, Admiral uh, Cunningham commanded a fleet that launched the first all-aircraft naval attack in history. The Royal Navy suffered heavy losses in the first two years of the war. Over 3,000 people were lost when the converted troop ship La Castria was sunk in June 1940, the greatest maritime disaster in Britain's history. The Navy's most uh, critical struggle was the Battle of the Atlantic, defending Britain's vital commercial supply lines against U-boat attack. A traditional convoy system was instituted from the start of the war, but German submarine tactics based on group attacks by wolf packs were much more effective in the previous war, <clears throat> and the threat remained serious for well uh, over three years. So they were much more effective in the previous war. This ship here, of course, this is the um, King George V battleship here on the left. Dudley Pond. Admiral of the fleet Sir Alfred Dudley Pickman Rogers Pond. That's a quite a name. Um, 1877 to 21st of October 1943 was a British senior officer of the Royal Navy. He served in the First World War as a battleship commander, taking part in the Battle of Jutland with notable success, contributing to the sinking of the German cruiser uh, Weisbaden. Weisbaden. He served as First Sea, first sea Lord the professional head of the Royal Navy for the first four years of the Second World War. In that role, his greatest achievement was his successful campaign against the German U-boats and the winning of the Battle of the Atlantic, but his judgment has been questioned over the failing Norwegian campaign in 1940. His dismissal of Admiral Dudley North um, in 1940 and Japan's sinking of Prince of Wales repulse in late 1941. 
Prince of Wales and repulsed. His order in July 1942 to disperse convoy uh, PQ-17 and withdraw its uh, covering forces to counter a threat from heavy German surface ships led to its destruction by submarines and aircraft. His health failed in 1943 and he resigned, dying shortly thereafter. That's Dudley Pond there. He directly under Winston Churchill as the um, first sea lord. Eric John Albert Rader. So 1876 uh, to, of course, uh, November 6, 1960, with a German admiral who played a major role in the naval history of the Second World War, uh, the Kriegsmarine. Rader attended the, the highest possible naval rank, attained the highest possible naval rank, that of Grand Admiral in 1939, becoming the first person to hold that rank since uh, Hennen von uh, Holzendorf. Raider led the Kriegsmarine for the first half of the war. He resigned in January 1943 and was pro uh, replaced by his um, his subordinate and uh, U-boat genius, uh, Admiral Karl Deonitz. Uh, at the Nuremberg trials, he was sentenced to life in prison, but was released early due to failing health. Raider believed the Navy was unprepared for the start of the Second World War by at least five years. The surface fleet was inadequate to fight the Royal Navy and instead ad adopted a strategy of convoy raiding. Raider wanted the Kriegsmarine to play an active part because he feared the budget would be cut after the war. The smaller ships were uh, dispersed around the world in order to force the Royal Navy to disperse their ships to combat them, while the battleships would carry out raids in north in the North Sea with a view uh, towards gradually reducing the Royal Navy's strength at home. Raider was unhappy with the outcome of the Battle of R the River Plate and believed that Hans Langsdor Langsdorf uh, should not have scuttled the ship, but instead sailed to engage the Royal Navy in the River Plate. Um, the R Battle of the River Plate was the first major battle of the... Um, and the Second World War and the first major naval battle um, involving the, the Royal Navy and the, the German, the Kriegsmarine. And, of course, um, he is upset with, of course, the, the Graf B, one of the Germany's newest pocket battleships being scuttled. And, of course, um, that's why he's upset, certainly, on that regard. <clears throat> Fleet Commander Hermann Bohm was held responsible by uh, and was sacked by Raider, who also issued orders that ships were to fight until the last shell and either win or sink with their flags flying. The Allies were using Norwegian airfields to transfer aircraft to the Finns fighting against the Soviets in the Winter War, as well as mining Norwegian waters, and the Germans were alarmed by those by these developments. If the Allies were to use Norwegian naval bases or successfully mine Norwegian waters, they could cut off the vital iron ore imports from Sweden and tighten the blockade of Germany. The Allies also uh, had made plans to invade Norway and Sweden in order to cut off the iron ore shipments to Germany. Admiral Rolf Kahls, commander of the Kriegsmarine in the Baltic Sea region, uh, proposed the invasion of Norway to Raider in September 1939. Raider briefed Hitler on the idea in October, but planning did not begin until December 1939. The operation was in low priority planning until the uh, the Altmark incident, uh, but was found a new sense of urgency thereafter. The invasion pr proved costly for the Kriegsmarine, losing a heavy cruiser, two of its uh, six light cruisers, ten of its twenty destroyers, and six U-boats. Very costly. And that was uh, the operation up in Norway. Yeah, amazing. The Royal Navy uh, struck home there. And that was the, fir that was the first um, attack. Uh, well, actually, that was the first attack um, in Norway. And, of course, uh, and that was after. Um, that was uh, So this was the second engagement. That's right. This was the second engagement after the River Plate. Um so this is, sorry, this is in, uh, the second direct engagement with the Royal Navy 
and the German Navy um, at the time. And of course, these are two, uh, the Battle of the River Plate and the invasion of Norway did not favor well uh, for the German Navy. In addition, almost all of the other capital ships were damaged and required dockyard repairs. And for a time, the German surface fleet had only three light cruisers and four destroyers operational in the aftermath of the Norwegian campaign. So Carl Downitz, born 16th September 1891, and uh, Garboy uh, Gernot by uh, Berlin, Germany. So he died in 1980 in West Germany. So he was the German Navy officer uh, that took uh, command of the German Navy in 1943. And, and he was the creator of Germany's World War II fleet, U-boat fleet. And he was an ace, a German top uh, German ace commander in the, um, in the First World War. And he took that training and tactics and newer in these newer designs and put them into practice for the, the new Kriegsmarine um, for the Second World War. So, um, Creator of in the creator of Germany's new U-boat fleet, who for a few days succeeded Adolf Hitler as German head of state for a few days, and that was at the end of the uh, end of the war after Hitler killed himself. But during World War One, Deonet served as a submarine officer in the Black Sea and in the Mediterranean. In the aftermath of Hitler's uh, accession to power, Deonet clandestinely supervised. Despite the Treaty of Versailles' um, absolute ban on Germany, German submarine construction, the creation of a new U-boat fleet, over which he was subsequently appointed commander 19, in 1936. In the early part of the war, Downitz did as much damage to the Allies as any German commander throughout his leadership of the U-boats in the Battle of the Atlantic. <clears throat> In the midst of World War II, in January 1943, he was called to replace Admiral Erich Rader as commander of the German Navy. His loyalty and ability soon won him the confidence of Adolf Hitler. On April 20th, 1945, shortly after the collapse of the Nazi regime, Hitler appointed Dönitz head of the Northern Military and Civil Command. Finally, in his last political testament, Hitler named Dönitz his successor as President of the Reich, Minister of War, and Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces. Assuming the reins of government on May 2, 1945, Dönitz retained office for only a few days. In 1946, he was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment by the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, and he was released from prison in 1956 and retired uh, on a government pension. Some of his memoirs uh, are published in 1958. So here's Karl Dönitz and the commanders, the top German commanders. 1939, the Kriegsmarine lacked the strength to challenge the combined British Royal Navy and French Navy, Marine Nationale, for command of the sea. Instead, German Navy stra naval strategy relied on commerce raiding after capital ships, armed merchant cruisers, submarines, and aircraft. <clears throat> and that they were using those um on and targeting british commerce many german warships were already at sea when war was declared including most of the available u-boats and the pocket warships the pocket battleships um in world war one after the uh german u-boats did such damage in world war one um the royal navy did not certainly did not focus on on submarine the threat of submarine warfare again and that was not until uh, roughly before the Second World War, and in the Second World War, they focused more on, um, the, again, submarines as part of their navy. It was not a major part of their of their um, their strategy. Um, they dealt with the submarine fleet, and they thought it was done with. And the Second World War certainly proved them wrong. The pressure shift, Deutschland, Admiral uh, Graspe. Uh, which had sorted into the Atlantic in August, these ships immediately attacked British and French shipping. U-30 sank the ocean liner, US, uh, ocean liner SS Athenia within hours of the declaration of war on September 3, 1939, in breach of her orders not to sink passenger ships. 
course, they didn't know what it was at the time. The U-boat fleet, which was to dominate so much of the Battle of the Atlantic, was small at the beginning of, war, of the war. Many of the 57, so it was 57 U-boats, uh, I didn't know the exact number, but 57, and so only uh, 34 or so um, capital or surface ships and 57 available U-boats were the um, were the small and short range uh, Type Twos. The Type Two had maybe three. Uh, they had uh, what uh, three internal torpedoes, uh, two uh, torpedo tubes. Um, a sec. So it actually has. So I'm reading here. It has three torpedo tubes, 21 inch, and five torpedoes uh, included. And of course, um, uh, I had to look that one up. Um, my memory was not as good tonight. Uh, so anyway, they um, type two. Um, they had um, a number, of course, that they were they were short range, and they only had the ability to submerge for you know uh, seven to eight hours. They could go maybe at four to five knots, maybe six knots submerged maximum, and then they would uh, go roughly about thirteen knots on the surface. Um, certainly. Those were mainly uh, slow U-boats and uh, designed after the First World War, or First World War hand-me-downs, and um, they were useful primarily for mine laying and operations in British coastal waters. Much of the early German anti-shipping activity involved mine laying by destroyers, aircraft, and U-boats off British ports. But the Kriegsmarine saw uh, as her main tasks uh, for the controlling of the Baltic Sea and winning a war against France in the connection with the German army because France had seen was seen as the most likely enemy in the event of war. So these are the main tasks early in the war. Um, but in 1938, Hitler wanted to have the possibility of winning a war against Great Britain at sea in the coming years. Therefore, he ordered plans for such a fleet from the Kriegsmarine. Daunting. From the three proposed plans, X, Y, and Z, he approved Plan Z in January 1939. <clears throat> this blueprint, and so that was uh, roughly eight months before the war. This blueprint for the new German uh, naval construction program in, in visions, uh, envisioned uh, building a navy of approximately 800 ships during the period of 1939-1947. Hitler demanded that the program was to be completed by 1945. The main force of Plan Z were six H-class battleships. In the version of Plan Z drawn up in 1939, the German fleet was planned to consist of the following ships by uh, 1945. Four aircraft carriers, ten battleships, uh, twelve battle cruisers, three armored ships, Panzer Schiff, um, Five heavy cruisers, 44 light cruisers, and 158 destroyers and torpedo boats, and 249 submarines. The only thing that they did, and numerous smaller craft, the only thing that they did uh, surpass in, a, in this number there is the, the U-boats. They had produced over 700, 750 U-boats for the Battle of the Atlantic, and th these U-boats raked millions of tons of enemy shipping. Right, the, the thousands of tons of shipping to the bottom, um, and certainly um, caused en enough trouble for the Allies that the Allies had to pick up um, without uh, Canada and the U.S. help. Great Britain would have had some major troubles on its own, maybe not have succeeded, and that uh, even with the British Navy as strong as it was. Personal strength was planned to rise over 200,000. The planning, uh, the planned naval program was not very far uh, advanced by the time uh, World War II began. So, not just more of the plan, um, of the Z plan. So the strength of the German fleet at the beginning of the war was not even 20% of the plan. On September 1st, 1939, the Navy still had a total personnel strength of about 78,000. That's the size of Canada's army today is roughly uh, 73,000, give or take. <clears throat> and at and it was not 
uh, at all ready for a major role uh, in the war because of the long time uh, it would take to get this Plan Z fleet ready for action. The shortage in workers and material in wartime. Plan Z was essentially shelved in September 1939 and the resources allocated for, of course, as I mentioned, construction of U-boats and uh, which would be ready for the war against the United Kingdom much quicker. They were, it was much uh, faster to build U-boats uh, than it was uh, taking years to build battleships and uh, cruisers and uh, but they did build a number of more destroyers um, in the short time <clears throat> so the u-boat development japan was the first country to benefit from the expertise of german engineers working under the cover of a foreign company in 1922 the Hague Brew Netherlands, uh, under the command of officers uh, Blum and Teckel, received the mission to design new models, development of types um, UC, UB3 and coastal UC3 for export. In 1926, Turkey and Finland, in 1930, and later Spain, purchased uh, officially these innovative Dutch subs. Um, Finland subsequently commanded two improved models of type 2a uh, precursors and these are coastal u-boats um, as i mentioned uh, these are only you know a couple 250 tons 260 tons um, have a crew around three officers 11 non-commissioned and uh, 11 enlisted members and these would be carrying the early g7a um, torpedo, which I will talk about later on, uh, the, t the T1, what we call. Um, so by 1933, while the Treaty of Versailles uh, was contested, was contested, no for formal program of submersible was has existed, not to cause a provocation. Beside the two units, uh, oceanic types um, 1A, advertised as prototypes, and the series of coastal type 2A and type 2B, the famous type 7 went out shortly after 1936. Um, and that was the one that would uh, do so much devastation within the Second World War. With the Anglo-German Naval Treaty um, announced, announcing the grand standard, the mature oceanic submersible of the, of the war, um, when the Third Reich uh, attacked Poland, total of submersibles in service were 72 units, U-25, U-26, um, 1A series, 6 Coastal 2A series, 19 uh, 2B series, 1936, 7 uh, uh, Type 2C series, and 15 Type 2D series in 1940, but also uh, 11 Ocean type um, 7A and some type 7B series plus seven great uh, oceanic um, type 9A series 1936. So a total of 47 coastal submersibles and 25 oceanic. Ocean submersibles conventional means uh, of type 7. Uh, that would will become legendary, performing regular 30-day cruises in the Atlantic in packs, while the Im immense uh, Type 9 would extend the raids on the seven seas. And Type 9s were the extended range U-boats that would attack the coast, the east coast of Canada and the United States. Um, <clears throat> the earlier Type 2s maybe had 1,500 to 1,800 mile range with um, petrol these newer u-boats uh type seven uh had maybe four to well five to six thousand uh, mile range and so they could cruise in the atlantic for um a month and mainly on the surface because they used their diesels on the surface but they had to submerge uh if they had to submerge they could crash dive within a number of up to 30 seconds and the amazing thing is, is these um, could stay underwater longer, they could go deeper, uh, but they could only go seven knots fully submerged uh, with their um, batteries 
at full capacity, flank speed. And that being true, that may seem like a lot, but it is not compared to escorts going 36, uh, 30, 30 to 36 knots above them and dropping depth charges. And they were able to um, stay underwater for as long as, well, uh, roughly as long as they had enough air. But of course, in a number of 8 to 10 hours to 12 hours and beyond, the buildup of carbon monoxide would force them to either um, switch on their uh, air exchange or they had an, um, their air system, which they could only use once in a patrol, uh, which is meant to help eat up some of the carbon monoxide, or um, they um, had to surface. They're, if they're the longer they stayed under at flank speed, uh, the much faster their batteries would uh, be depleted, which in it could have happened as far as four to six hours. Um, that's why they went, uh, of course, sometimes under the water, being depth charged or being hunted by Aztec sonar, they would stay under at. Uh, at creep speed, or which we call silent running, at 55 RPM, they could stay under and uh, at any depth, like from uh, 150 to 200 meters, <clears throat> and hold there and stay. Is but of course they would be hour after hour of uh, escorts running over them, dropping depth charges. Early in the war, their depth charges weren't nearly as effective. The depth of 91 meters. Later in the war, that certainly was to change, certainly with the technology. <clears throat> so they could run uh, silent speed, and the silent speed would be 55 RPM, and uh, what they call engaged silent running, and stay under roughly, that's about one knot. And... <clears throat> If they made, and of course, if they made any noise at all, you know, things falling down, lead tensors falling down, I mean, that could potentially be heard by the destroyer, and then they, and then they stay around, they, and, and depth charge them some more, and as soon as, you know, 40, 41, newer depth charges came out, uh, they were, they started losing numerous, newer, uh, well, great German aces, Gunther Prime being one of them. Um, and I'll talk about him later on. So early in the war, Dönitz submitted a memorandum of, to Grand Art Admiral Eric Rader, the German Navy's commander-in-chief, in which he estimated effective submarine warfare could bring Britain to its knees because of the country's dependence on overseas commerce. He advocated a system known as the uh, Rudel uh, Rudel Tactic, so-called Wolf Pack, in which U-boats would spread out in a long line across the projected course of a convoy. Along, upon sighting a target, they would come together to attack in mass and overwhelm any escorting ships, warships, while destroyer, while escorts chased individual submarines. The rest of the pack would be able to attack the merchant ships with impunity. Then it's calculated 300. Uh, of the latest attack bo Atlantic boats, the Type 7 boats, would create enough havoc among Allied shipping that Britain would be knocked out of the war. And that's a Type 7 there. <clears throat> that's a Type 7B, I believe. The German occupation of Norway uh, in 1940, the rapid conquest of the Low Countries in France in May and June, and the Italian entry into the war on the Axis side in June transformed the the war at sea in general and the Atlantic campaign in particular in three main ways. Britain lost its biggest ally in 1940. The French Navy was the fourth largest in the world. Only a handful of French ships joined the free uh, French forces and fought against Germany. Though these were later joined by a, f a few Canadian built corvettes, flower class corvettes, with the French fleet removed from the campaign, the Royal Navy was stretched even further. Italy's declaration of war meant that Britain also had to reinforce the Mediterranean fleet and establish a new group at Gibraltar, known as Force H, to replace the French fleet 
in the western Mediterranean. The U-boats gained direct access to the Atlantic. Since the English Channel was relatively shallow and the, was particularly blocked uh, with um, par was partially blocked with minefields in, by mid 1940, U-boats were ordered to negotiate it, and said travel along around the British Isles to reach the most profitable spots to hunt ships. The German bases in France at Brest, Lorient, and La Palace uh, near uh, La Rochelle, La Rochelle uh, were about 450 miles, 720 kilometers closer to the Atlantic than the bases on the North Sea. And the bases, one of them being uh, Wilmshaven, uh, which they would, the German U-boats would have to uh, go across um, Denmark to get out into the North Sea and around Great Britain. In the coastal, and they would attack coastal areas um, on the east side and the west side of Great Britain, and that's early in the war. This greatly improved the situation for U-boats in the Atlantic, enabling them to attack convoys further west and letting them spend longer time on patrol, doubting at uh, doubling the effective size of the U-boat force. The Germans later built. A huge fortified concrete submarine pens for the U-boats in the French Atlantic bases, which were impervious to Allied bombing until mid-1944, when the Talboy bomb became available. From early July, U-boats returned to the French, um, to the new French bases when uh, they had completed their Atlantic patrols. British destroyers were diverted from the Atlantic. The Norwegian campaign and the German invasion of the Low Countries and France posed a heavy strain on the Royal Navy's destroyer flotillas. Many older de destroyers were withdrawn from convoys, convoy routes to support the Norwegian campaign in April and May, and then diverted to the English Channel to support the withdrawal from Dunkirk. By the summer of 1940, Britain faced a serious threat of invasion. Many destroyers were held in the Channel ready to repel a German invasion. So here we have um, Wilmshaven and Kiel. So Wilmshaven, uh, so, sorry, it was Kiel, where I meant um, Wilmshaven is here. We can come out and circle around Great Britain. It was Kiel, what I meant. Kiel is a top major German naval base. You'd have to go around Dunkirk. So, uh, and then you have Christian Sand, Yersund, and these are bases that are captured from Nor the invasion of Norway. Um, so Kiel, where they come around, and of course Wilmshaven, direct entry to the North Sea, and around uh, they go around England uh, by via Shetland Island area and uh, continue down through into other areas. So these are some of the. Uh, so this is April 7th, April 9th, 1940, the invasion of Norway, again, as I mentioned before, uh, Wesrenbung Nord, uh, and that's the the fleet, uh, the British home fleet's engagements and the German inv in engagements. Admiral Hipper, Lowworm, uh, Guinnessu, Skornhos, and versus Renown, and, yep. So U-30. She was ordered in April 1935 um, in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, which prevented the construction and commissioning of any U-boats in the German Navy for the German Navy, and as part of the German Naval Rearmament Program known as Plan Z. She sank the liner SS Athenia on 3rd of September 1939 under the command of Fritz Julius Limpf. Um, she was retired from frontline service in September 1940 after undertaking eight war patrols, having sunk 17 vessels and damaging two others. U-30 then served in a training role until the end of the war when she was scuttled. She was later raised and broken up for scrap in 1948. So this was a Type uh, 7A. Um, so what they have is uh, two men two-man, uh, six-cylinder, four-stroke uh, diesel engines um, operated, and of course, if you're going to, 2100 to 2300 um, 
share and it's on this trading list, sorry, a kilowatt into 1500 kill, 1700 kilowatt. So, okay, 2000, 2200 um, shaft horsepower. Um, <clears throat> so that's uh, BHP. Yeah. As well as two brown uh, Bavarian. So anyway, the electric motors um, that produced roughly 740 shaft horsepower um, were enabled it to go roughly with six, seven knots submerged, um, and allowed her to travel at a maximum of 17 knots while surfaced at flank speed. So they, they mentioned eight knots submerged. That's rarely eight knots, but it's mainly seven knots from what I've read. She had a range of 6,000 miles, 6,200 miles, um, but 7,100 miles at 10 knots. Uh, so the slower you go, the more range you have with your, uh, with your diesel, uh, the amount of fuel you have on board. We're all on the surface and, uh, so that is uh, that's what it has as far as its capability. Um, certainly, at flank speed, you have less you have less um, <clears throat> you have less range because you're using more fuel. So, flanks you know at higher speed, uh, six thousand two hundred miles. While submerged, uh, so while submerged, uh, it has a range of about. Uh, to 108 miles at four knots and uh, so uh, 135 to 175 kilom 74 kilometers at maybe like oh uh, so that is that's the kilometers that's 84 to 108 miles at four knots um that's well submerged it has five torpedo tubes it has four in the bow, and these are 533 millimeter torpedo tubes. She could also carry a total of um, 11 21 inch, um, five, uh, 53, 53 centimeters, so 500. Um, it's, that's the same thing, 21 inch or 22 TMA mines or 33 TMB mines, and had a. It has a, a lot of the U boats, the Type 7s, have a 8.8 .8 centimeter. 3.5 inch gun and that can hit from uh, you know three four miles or more depending on the seas and uh, a lot of times when uh, they were trying to save torpedoes early in the war during the happy times they could just use their um, their guns and sink merchant ship after merchant ship if they weren't uh, that's uh, counting if they weren't if the merchant ships weren't armed with guns themselves later on in the war they were uh, similar type guns, um, three inch guns, um, but they had uh, anti aircraft shells. They had eighty armor piercing shells, another hundred and twenty um, high explosive shells. So about two hundred twenty rounds all in total. And of course, uh, this uh, sub was equipped with one two centimeter C thirty anti aircraft gun. After being commissioned and deployed, U-30 was stationed in the port city of Wilmshaven. So that's the seventh flotilla, I believe. Um, the seventh flotilla, uh, the first flotilla, and the second, and the second were moved down to France, in 1940, and the seventh retained up in Wilmshaven. Um, what I remember. So here's U-30. On September 3rd, 1939, while well, in command of U-30, um, U-30 sank uh, the 13,581-ton passenger ship, the Athenia. This is the first British um, ship to be sunk. So the first German, um, first German U-boat to draw blood. So the first British ship sunk in World War II. Commander Lemp uh, later claimed that uh, the fact that she was steering a zigzag course and seemed to be well off the normal shipping routes made him believe that she was either a troop ship or an armed merchant cruiser. When he realized his error, he took the first steps to conceal the facts by omitting 
to make an entry in the submarine's log and swearing his crew to secrecy. Adolf uh, Hitler decided the incident should be kept secret for political reasons and the German newspaper uh, Voskeir uh, Bovacher uh, published an article which blamed the loss of the Athenia on the British, accusing Winston Churchill, then First Lord of the Admiralty, of, of sinking the ship to turn neutral opinion against Nazi Germany. The truth did not emerge until January 1946 at the Nuremberg Trials during the case against Grand Admiral Eric Crater, when a statement by Admiral Dernitz was read in which he admitted that the Athenia had been torpedoed by U-30 and every effort had been made to cover it up, including ordering Wimp to alter his log book. Yeah. And here's the Athenia here. The Athenia was the first UK ship to be sunk by Germany in World War II. And the incident accounted for the Donaldson Line's greatest single loss of life at sea, with 117 civilian passengers and crew killed. The sinking was condemned by as a war crime. Among those dead were 28 U.S. citizens, leading Germany to fear that the U.S. might join the war on the side of the U.K. and France. Wartime, and which did happen, and certainly... Uh, uh, late in '41, of course, after the um, yeah, after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, wartime German authorities denied that one of their vessels had sunk the ship. An admission uh, of responsibility did not come from German authorities until 1946. September 1st, 1939, the Athenia, commanded by Captain James Cook, left Glasgow for Montreal via Liverpool in Belfast. She carried 1,103 passengers, including 500 Jewish refugees, 469 Canadians, 311 U.S. citizens, and 72 U.K. subjects, and 315 crew. Despite clear indications that war would break out any day, she departed Liverpool uh, at 1300 hours on Sept the uh, 2nd of September without recall and on the evening of the 3rd was 60 nautical miles south of Rockall and 200 nautical miles 370 kilometers northwest of um, Istanbul, Ireland when she was sighted by the German submarine U-30 commanded by Commander Lempf around 1630 so that's 4.30 p.m. Lemp later claimed that the fact that the fact that uh, she was a darkened ship steering a zigzag course, which seemed to be well off the normal shipping uh, routes, made and which made him um, believe she was either a troop ship or Q ship uh, or armed merchant cruiser. So U thirty tracked Athenia uh, for three hours until um, eventually at at nine forty. Uh, sorry, at 1940, 7.40 p.m., when both vessels were between Rockall and, and Torrey Island, Lemp ordered two torpedoes to be fired. One exploded on Athenia's port side in her engine room, and she began to, to settle by the stern. Several ships, including E-class destroyer HMS Electra, responded to Athenia's distress signal. Electra, Electra's commander, Lieutenant Commander Semi, a bus was a senior officer present and took took charge. He sent the F-class destroyer HMS Fame on an anti-submarine sweep of the area, while Electra, another E-class destroyer HM, and HMS Escort, the, the Swedish yacht Southern Cross, the 5,749 uh, um, ton Norwegian tanker MS Coot Nelson and U.S. cargo ship City of Flint rescued survivors. So a lot of ships come around to rescue survivors. Between them, they rescued about 981 passengers and crew. The German liner SS Bremen, en route from New York to Murmansk, also received Athena's distress signal, but ignored it. City of Flint took 223 survivors at, to Pier 21 at Halifax, and Coot Nelson landed 450 at Galway. Amazing. Athenia remained afloat for more than 14 hours until she finally sank stern first at uh, 0.1040 the next morning. 
of the 1418 aboard. 98 passengers and 19 crew members were killed. Many died in the engine room and aft stairwell where the torpedo hit and uh, water flooded in very quickly uh, from the, the aft bulkhead area. Um, the British crews were famous uh, for putting the passengers' lives before their own and were expertly trained to handle such events. Nonetheless, 50 people died when one of the lifeboats was crushed in the propeller of the of the Knut Nelson, which is one of the ships that was trying to save them. Um, so here is <clears throat> another great picture of the the ship. That's a 13,000 ton GRT ship. That's a, a large kill for a uh, U -boat, a young U-boat commander. With the outbreak of war, the British and French immediately began a blockade of Germany. Although this had little immediate effect on German industry, the Royal Navy quickly introduced a convoy system for the protection of trade uh, that gradually extended out from the British Isles, eventually reaching as far as Panama, Bombay, and Singapore. Convoys allowed the, the Royal Navy to concentrate its escorts near the one place U-boats were guaranteed to be found, the convoys. Each convoy consisted of 30 to 70 mostly unarmed merchant ships. From the U.S. perspective, the struggle moved through three phases. When the war began in, in Europe, the United States maintained neutrality while also increasing the readiness of its fleet. After signing the two ocean navy uh, legislation in the summer of 1940, Princeton, uh, sorry, President Franklin Roosevelt, FDR, next pushed to assist Great Britain, which was the Lend-Lease Agreement. They gave a number of uh, old ex-World War I destroyers to the British Navy. In August 1940, he arranged a loan of older destroyers in exchange for the use of British bases in the Western Hemisphere. The following March, he secured a passage uh, of the Len Lease Act to enable a cash starved Britain to receive equipment and supplies and then pay for them later. Here's one of the early depth charges uh, on the um, one of these is one of the side launch um, limbo launchers that were on the side of the destroyers and they would uh, most of them of the depth charges were launched on the back racks of the ships. Uh, and launched two at a time into the sea. This way they could have two to three of these um, <clears throat> mortar, um, the depth charge mortars, able to launch on via the side. And they could uh, attack and uh, depth charge U-boats uh, that were still trying to get under the lethal limit of the early depth charges. <clears throat> first phase of the battle of the Atlantic lasted from autumn 1939 until the fall of France in June 1940. During that period, the Anglo-French coalition drove German merchant shipping from the sea and established a fairly effective long-range blockade, while the German Navy attempted to inflict some measure of damage on Allied forces at sea. The battle took a radical different turn in May June 1940, following the Axis conquest of the Low Countries. The fall of France and Italy's entry into the war on the Axis side, Britain lost French naval support just when its own sea power had been hurt by losses incurred in the retreat from Norway and the evacuation from Dunkirk and stretched by Italian uh, belligerency. <clears throat> Axis air power imperiled and, uh, imperiled and eventually barred the direct route through the Mediterranean Sea to the Suez Canal, forcing the British shipping to use the long alternative route along the Cape of Good Hope. <clears throat> that cut the total car cargo, cargo carrying cap capacity of the British merchant marine almost in half at the very moment when German acquisition of naval and air bases on the Atlantic coast foreshadowed more destructive attacks on shipping in northern waters. From the German perspective, 
with the conquest of Western Europe complete, knocking out Britain, knocking Britain out of the war by attacking its trade seemed a manageable effective. Beginning in the autumn of 1940, during the happy times, what they call the U-boat happy times, the first happy times, German U-boat submarine attacks were dramatically successful. And over the winter, Germany also sent out its major surface warships and air power. Some British naval officers, particularly the First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, fought, sought a more uh, offensive strategy. The Royal Navy formed anti-submarine 